blank period, yeah I'm a black, brown, and indigenous Gotta holla if you really feeling this Gotta holla if you really real enough Other rappers is delirious Yeah, it's really that serious Better holla if you really feeling me I gotta keep it a hundred, ayy If you don't like it, then fuck it, ayy We gonna win in the end, yeah We gonna live in abundance I gotta keep it a hundred, ayy If you don't like it, then fuck it, ayy We gonna win in the end, yeah We gonna, we gonna, we gonna I gotta keep it a hundred We gotta stop all the stunting You know we coming from nothing Yo, you talking about money, you bluffing We gotta do something different We gotta change how we live in We gotta do better for women We gotta do better for children We gotta listen to victims Whether Jewish, or Muslim, or Christian It doesn't matter your religion You gotta stand against the system Or else you just another villain How you just sitting there chilling Peace, peace, everyone. Peace. Come on. Peace, peace, everyone. I love saying that word, peace. Good evening, everybody. I had to redo my intro because while I was trying to edit, I realized the intro was not there. But without further ado, thank you so much for coming on to the Jabari Mock Podcast. Uh, my name is Jamar Jabari. And today we're going to talk about the writer's guild and their strike and how we can help and get more information on what are their demands now a company with me i have my friend pt who i actually went to high school with man amazing i'm proud of him following his dream to be a writer and also getting in to hollywood and getting a credit on a netflix show great guy we're going to talk about but what's important is how so many things around the country so many places are striking you got starbucks you got my my teamsters union the ups workers i'm i'm the teamster for 443 but it looks like the ups workers up in the 800s i think it's 803 they're striking and they're getting ready to do the biggest strike in history this is what we have in common at workers. We all want to live a great life, benefits, uh, pursuit of happiness, and our labor is what makes these CEOs uh, rich. Our labor is what makes capitalism, uh, these capitalists stay afloat. So I think it's very, very important that we stay in solidarity with every single person that is fighting, for better wages, better treatment and dignity on their jobs, union or not union, whatever, whatever workers that are fighting. So that's why we're having this conversation. You know, as a union worker, Mr. Teamsters, I am very, very excited to have this conversation. Very big deal. So without further ado, we're gonna talk with my guy, PT, who is not with the Writers Guild yet, but has been in that world, getting credits towards getting to the writing scale, and also sitting in solidarity. So we're going to learn a lot of information. This, this is his work. On the show SWAT, which is another show Sean created that's uh, also on TV right now. Um, so he's not a full member yet, but he has points towards membership for that episode that he wrote. Um, shout out to John Amato, great guy. Um, yeah so okay uh, it, it, so it just, was kind of like similar. sag to get in basically yeah yeah it's it's similar to sag it, it, it's a very different industry and thus um has different um requirements for entering a union than uh than the teamsters do uh mm -hmm. since like you know people don't like work consistently in like any branch of the industry even if you right. even if you're like absurdly successful that just means you're still hopping around from job to job um you're just doing it wow. more consistently than some other people do and obviously um the the thing with the union being that uh you have people from a very wide range of relative incomes makes things makes things rather unique like 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 writers are largely middle or working class um like on average but obviously mm -hmm. you have people in all these unions be the screen actors guild directors guild writers guild 
who are quite wealthy, including my boss. But um, mm -hmm. so it, it's it's a very different labor landscape, which is uh, why hopefully it'll be interesting for you and your listeners to hear about. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 get into it because I last time I read there's about eleven thousand members and I saw that yeah. the medium income was uh for full timers uh was like almost fifty grand and then for part timers was like twenty eight twenty eight grand. Yeah. So you're saying that there's different brackets that you can become wealthy, but you basically have to start your own, like how your boss is right now, like make your own well, like well yeah like a, it, a it, chapter. It, it, a very small percentage of writers are obviously like quite wealthy. Like if you created like, I mean, I mean like the writers on friends are all insanely wealthy because of residuals, right? Like it's right. an incredibly successful show. And every, and every time an episode airs on TV and reruns, they get residuals every time like a studio, uh, like streaming services do huge bidding wars over um, the streaming rights, they get huge residuals. So they are all sitting pretty. I think half of them like retire retired at like 50 just because like they didn't really need to work anymore. Um, a, a number of them are still are still creating a lot of a lot of shit, but you know, they're mm. doing quite well for themselves. And Sean, obviously, uh, he uh, he created the shield. He created uh, SWAT, which is a big money maker. Um, over the past decade. And uh, so he is definitely in like the top 1%. But uh, when you say like full time writers, like what you're generally talking about is like, people who um, tend to work like 30 to 40 or 50 weeks a year, or like 30 okay. to 40 weeks a year. And um, because rooms run varying times, depending on what type of show you're talking about. And I mean, one of the bigger aspects of the things being negotiated right now is longer room times. Like okay. they don't want mini rooms that only run like five to 10 weeks or, um, or anything like that because they, they feel like they're, because they feel like they're just getting squeezed for ideas by the studios and not really able to make like good income. It, as a result, you have a number of people who are working in this industry who are, are only working professionally as writers for like 20 weeks a year, which uh -huh. like they're making decent enough money during that time but it's only 20 weeks. And obviously like, it's not like you can like work and work as an accountant to hop off for 20 weeks and then hop back on or like or a restaurant or whatever. Like, be, like it's difficult to like get work, hop back off and hop back and forth whenever you get writing gigs. So if you're committing to being a writer in any fashion, you want to be able to get, to be able to steadily get work for uh, in that world. So if you, and if you don't, then yeah, you could end up with uh end up with overall pay of like less than thirty grand a year. And I'm not sure if that's factoring if that's after you factor in like uh, like you you'll see big numbers in terms of what writers make week to week. But what people need right. to understand is they end up they usually end up keeping like a third of it because like a uh, because you're in the highest some of the highest tax brackets in America. Uh -huh. it, whether you're talking about working in New York City or LA, which is where like 95% of TV writers work, or right. and on top of that, you have an agent, possibly a manager. Uh, you you have to have a lawyer and a and a um, accountant it, because like the tax the taxation of writers is just so complicated uh, that uh, oh that you God. you don't see a ton of that money at the end of the day. So like again, right. like the thing is. Yes, a lot of writers who are like consistently working, even if they're not like big creators like Sean Ryan or Aaron Sorkin, are making decent middle class money. But but when people see these what seem to be very large numbers, they have to like like I've been told over and over again by the people who I work under, they expect to keep roughly a third of whatever they negotiate for any for any particular job. So that is so horrible. That's awful. Yeah, it yeah. sucks uh, in a lot of ways. Obviously, there's upsides. Like if you if you do well in this field, you can make good money, and obviously, it's very fulfilling. But yeah. there's a lot of downside for the people who are just trying to make it. And um, yeah, so it's uh, a, it's a it's the we're not we're not negotiating like the studios are saying or like some people are saying to like sit in our, sit on our ass and, and rake in big bucks. Like, we're, right. like we are trying to make sure that everyone from the top to the bottom can make a decent living because, right. uh, because everybody deserves that. I find it funny that people are used to telling people that actually produce the wealth 
that they're sitting on their ass when the actual CEOs are making the surplus of money and apparently they're not sitting on their ass going to golfing and all this stuff. <laughs> like And creating Quibi. Um. Right. <laughs> it's just so ironic how people say that, you know? And they're not the ones writing these scripts. There's so many shows. I feel like there's a lot more shows now in this era than there was shows before I was born or while I was growing up. This is like a very big booming business that gives a surplus of billions of dollars, like from hundreds of billions, right? It's just, it's 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 at its peak on revenue than ever. Yeah, it's it's near the peak of revenue right now. Um, the 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 sheer volume of content is slowing down a bit, just because like the real boom of content was just like the streamers competing with each other to try and just get as much shit on the wall as possible and see what sticks. But okay. it's but compared to like, but compared to like the two thousands, uh, the I don't I don't like I don't see the volume uh, the sheer volume of it like getting down to that level because obviously like. At the, t- at the time, there was like only so much space. There was only so many networks and they only had so many time slots to put on new stuff. And yeah. I don't see the volume ever getting back down to that level again, since like, especially since like all those networks still exist, right? So, and mm-hmm. the, then there's all the streaming services and, um, and yeah, like the, these companies are making like unparalleled amounts of money um, off the backs of uh, not just writers, obviously, but like everyone yeah. in this industry and as is the case, and I'm sure you would agree with me on this, as is the case with many industries where they, where the current, um, it, I mean, this has kind of always been the case, but I feel like it's getting worse lately with like shareholder capitalism that the yeah. incentives are to put all the money towards the people at the top, the shareholders, the CEOs and whatnot right. at the expense of the long-term health of the individual companies and the industries and most, and probably most importantly, the economy as a whole. So right. it, it th- this is a thing across the board, but like, but like the thing that that people are always pointing out is like, n- this isn't unreasonable because it's a very because yes we want the writers to make good money, but like when you look at as in the in the grand scheme of things, it's a very small slice of the overall pie of the industry that can still make huge amounts of money, but still make writing a viable career. Like something that I remember Craig Mason, who is um, a, a very prominent writer. He created like the last of us and he, and he, and he's a co-host on probably the most popular screenwriting podcast script notes always mm-hmm. says is like, you want this to be a viable job for people to have, right? Like, you, like you, right. you want smart people to want to do this. Otherwise, like if you make this like a job, like if you make this like a slum profession, then you're just going to get like desperate people and right. you're not going to get these, you're not going to get these like bright, brilliant people that create shows like the shield or, or um, any, any other number of what, whatever's on TV right now. Like these are like, like the last of us is a very smart show. Um, Ted oh, Lasso was it. a very smart show for, for the first two seasons. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, <laughs> but um there's a lot of stuff right now, and I feel like we're act- we actually are in a really good era for like really smart, intelligent TV succession. Yes, and I, I believe that. Yes. Yeah, and you want you want it to continue to be a job that people that people don't see as like a black hole, like like that. You don't want it to be one of those things where, like, oh, only a small profession small uh, small percentage excuse me of the people in the in the job get very rich and everyone else gets scraps like you want it to have like a broad base of uh of viability for a career so right. um it like it people will always accept that it's a competitive field like it's hard like it's harder to become a tv writer statistically than it is to get into harvard but Damn. but um it's <laughs> uh <laughs> It, no, no, seriously. Like, if you look at like the number of people who try relative to the number of people who succeed ver- right. versus like the Harvard numbers, it, it it is statistically harder. But like, um, uh, I will say that like the the talent pool who fails to get into Harvard is probably smarter than the talent pool that fails to become a TV writer. Given the, <laughs> I, I I used to read I used to read a lot of scripts for like as like favors and a lot of people you know whatever. Um, right, you had time in Boston. That's right, you used to live in Boston. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
Um, but um, yeah, yeah. So people will always accept that this industry is hard to break into, but they, but you want it. You want a, a smart guy, whether we're talking about like a Yale graduate or just like a guy with just like street smart, someone who's clever to be able to look at this job and find it appealing so that you can get their good ideas and milk it for content. Like, and I'm just talking right. from a capitalistic standpoint, like whether you, right. whether you approve of the profit motive or not, like these people want to make money. And right. if they want to continue to make money, they can't rely on idiots or robots, which are essentially which are essentially replacement for idiots, this AI stuff that like it, that can't remember what it wrote three paragraphs ago. It makes up fake legal cases. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll get, yeah, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure you have questions about the AI shit, but yeah, it, it, <laughs> I, I won't ramble on to, I won't ramble on any more about this. You get the idea. Oh, no, you're fine. No, we're, we're, we're learning a lot of information, which is really, really good because this is a world that I feel like a lot of people don't really know about, uh, honestly. And and it's a small community compared to the regular working, uh, like, blue-collar man. And, you know, it's good to learn, like, the, the, the outside and insides of these, uh, of, of how these, these uh, shows and stuff are created and what, what goes on in between. Yeah, um, yeah. One of the things that like my relatives in Boston, some of my older relatives who were like union people find the weirdest about this is when I talk about like some of the people who are on the picket lines, including my boss, who's like very supportive of the union. He uh -huh. he actually wrote. Um, a, so last time the the 2008 strike, he wrote an open letter to other showrunners. So like his fellow like wealthy creative um, mm -hmm. that like they all had an obligation to stop all their show running duties and not just the writing part. So like no more producing, no more, no more being in the editing bay, no more doing anything um, until we get what we want. And that's an nice. important precedent where like Shonda Rhimes and other who, who's mostly known for creating Grey's Anatomy, but is also responsible for like Bridgerton. So like absurdly successful writer, um, mm. uh, all put their pens down and, and stop producing work. And that became like an expectation for this time, like the guy who created Andor was still working in England when the strike went on. And wow. um, it wasn't until there, like an immense pressure came down on him. Now, he said that he thought it was different because he was in the UK and right. he wasn't writing anything. And I'll give him the benefit of the doubt. It, it was just kind of surprising since like if you watch that show, it's like very overt that this guy has very left leaning politics. Yeah. So I'll so I'll forgive I'll forgive it. But like he, he did like <laughs> after. Yeah, after a bit of pressure, say, okay, you guys aren't getting any more shoots out of me. Um, if you want to keep trying to make the show without without me with the scripts that are already written, go ahead, but I'm going home. Um, mm, nice. uh, it, but yeah, so like, so one of the things my re relatives found the weirdest about this was just the fact that like there are millionaires on picket lines who are there for reasons other than just like the good publicity of it. Like, <laughs> like something that blew my mind is that Jason Sudeikis has been on the picket lines for like. For at Warner Brothers almost every day, like, yeah. uh, like he, he's not one of the ones who's like whose like livelihood depends on whether or not this strike goes well. But right. he's there anyway, and it obviously awesome. there's going to be there's going to be some of these people who are ha who are content with their own wealth. Who I won't name names, but like the, mm. who are content with their own wealth and uh, would rather the strike just end because they can't continue to make their own money. Uh, but um, he, it, it, it is a weird industry in that you see uh, millionaires, uh, people who are like incredibly wealthy, like very down for the cause. I think it's probably just because they feel so there's a greater sense of solidarity in this profession yeah. than even like other creative professions. Like you don't see this as much with like Screen Actors Guild strikes. Although I did see Elizabeth Banks on the picket the other day. Like she was literally two feet behind me. Oh, um, wow. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, um, uh, you, you get you get some good people out here. There's a lot of shitty people in Hollywood, but you get some good people out here. Um, yeah, I saw Seth MacFarlane uh, was uh, was also. Oh yes, yeah, oh Saturday. yeah, Seth MacFarlane. Seth MacFarlane is a good is a very good egg in this respect. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, like uh, like a lot of them, but well, I, I feel like a lot of them. Like if you read Seth MacFarlane's story, for example, like he when he was first like pitching family guy, like he was animating like each frame by hand. And he's probably just thinking like, I want the next guy to have it easier than I did. So mm -hmm. that's just me speculating, but you know, um, uh, you mm -hmm. get the idea. You think it's, that it's he's a going very... to pass the torch with family guy. Is that what you're, uh, well, well, 
I mean, this is a different topic, but I don't think he's yeah. actually running <laughs> Family Guy these days. Um, ah, he, uh, okay. He's got a number of other projects. It's my understanding that, like, I, I, have, I have actually met a, one of the Family Guy writers, and it's my understanding that he does show up to the room every once in a while. He likes to keep tabs with what's going on, but mostly what he does is just show up for the voiceover work. Like, that's not, ah, okay. like, it's, it, he is not running the day to day anymore, which is fine. He passed it on to someone else who's, who I would say is doing a good job. Um, mm. But yeah, that's a that's a whole other thing. Um, when yeah, shows run for long enough, the creators tend to want to do something else. Right. <laughs> it's very interesting. What are some other demands? Um, let's get into the demands part. Um, what yeah. are other demands that the the, the writer strike is uh, demanding? Um, is there a healthcare needs? Are there uh, yes? Let me. I, I actually I actually pulled up the demands. Give me a sec. Yeah. Okay, so there is a number of proposals that they they actually tweeted out a term sheet and like what the AMPTP a um, uh, countered with, and a lot of the like counters are like a uh, uh, refuse proposal, uh, refuse to counter, um, which people have been putting on T-shirts. But I mean, there's a number of things with respect to healthcare. I mean, uh, the healthcare. So the healthcare system for the Writers Guild is like pretty good, given that it's mostly like freelance work, mm -hmm. but it's uh, it, it's obviously pretty complicated. Just looking at the pension and health, um, each member of a team gets P and H contributions as if they were writing as an individual, which I believe which I believe just means that um, uh, better uh, better uh, healthcare better healthcare contributions for TV writers. Um, a lot of the terms that were being discussed were mostly for TV TV writers, but I, I mean the majority of the members, are working members, write for TV, so that's important. Um, mm -hmm. Let's see what else. Um, uh, there, there was all the AI shit. Um, they uh, want a big thing was for streaming residuals. Um, uh, it, so, so. Um, just a, like a little personal anecdote from a friend of mine. So, or he's one of the writers on the, on the, uh, on the staff of the night agent. So he recently wrote um, a show for a network and he compared that to, to what he made for streaming. So streaming in the last strike, they came to a tentative agreement that basically just said, look, Streaming is at this point, 2009, a relatively new thing. So we're going to go easier on the terms here as you guys get your sea legs and like a step, see if this is like a viable thing for TV moving forward. And obviously it is now. So so we want residual residuals for streaming to look similar to what we get for network. And my friend, uh, who's uh, again, he's a he's a writer on the night agent he showed his first residual check for this network show that he wrote. So this is something he can expect monthly. The number will go down as like the show is watch less because people watch new things more than they watch old things, but it was mm -hmm. about $6,000. Okay. Um, he sh then he showed me a check he got for streaming and, and, and no, the night agent is one of the most successful shows in Netflix's history in terms of viewership. Like it, like I believe in terms of overall viewership, we beat season three of Stranger Things. So that that's wow. an important thing to keep in mind. Congrats, PC. It, no, yeah, it was you no, know, yeah, it performed really <laughs> well. Um, it it um, I would say in the United States, it performed mostly better with like older people, like the Yellowstone crowd, mm -hmm. um, which is why you don't see as much of it on social media. But viewership is viewership, and it did very well overseas as well, which was kind of surprising given that it's such an American centric show. But anyway, right. so he showed me his streaming check for the night agent, and it was about fifty six cents. Oh wow! Yeah, the the residual the residuals for streaming are just unbelievably like shitty. So Jesus they Christ. so that's a really important sticking point, and it you know it's difficult to predict the future. Like last time, last time the writer struck, one of the biggest sticking points was for DVD residuals, and they got really this good terms on it. Right? Yeah, two thousand eight. Um, Sure. But yeah, so, but yeah, obviously like DVD physical media is not really like a thing anymore um, mm -hmm. in terms of like what money you expect a TV, a TV show or a movie to make. Um, like it's good that we secured those things, but it, it but it's uh, not viable in the long run. So that's a very important sticking point. Mm -hmm. 
there's also a lot of stuff about like um, it, when it comes to features, uh, trying to minimize the amount of free work. Like the studios will put pressure on whoever they hire to write any particular script to say, um, like, say I hire you to write the um, the the bio biopic of Kyle Rittenhouse, right? Um, and okay. uh, you do you do a first you do a first pass on what led him to uh, on like what led him to do do what he did and um and the studio likes it but they want you to do a second pass and mm -hmm. now they should be paying you for this but they don't always have to if you don't feel like you're in a position to really say no so oh my writers will do God. pass after will do pass after pass um without um guarantee of pay um so it's free labor. Like, it is free labor yes and um and this is it's especially bad for like up and coming writers like obviously like the studio can't ask quentin tarantino to do more work for less pay um yeah. aaron sorkin isn't particularly <laughs> worried about this but yeah. um for other people it's a it's a real pain in the ass it's free labor and there's already like a lot of free labor built into the system like yeah. the fact that like in order to sell a script in the first place you kind of have to write it on your own um right. at least if, at least if it's an original idea but um so like a big thing is like guaranteed second step meaning meaning like you're guaranteed pay for a second pass whether you do one or not um and weekly pay meaning uh 50 pay upon commencement and remaining 50 percent to be pay, paid out over weekly over the writing period applies if the writer is paid less than 250 percent of minimum writers above this threshold have the right to opt into weekly pay. So basic that mm -hmm. that term is basically just pay structure. Um, okay. And there's a lot of stuff about like um, uh, man mandatory minimums, meaning like um, you, it, so so like you if for streaming features you right now are not getting the same kind of pay you get for features that are released in theaters because writers are expected like a percent of the box office, but. Okay. Um, what they're trying to negotiate is terms where you where you will get paid based on the amount you would expect it to make if it was released the, released wide theatrically. So there's a lot of complicated like accounting shit that goes into that, but it, but you get the idea. Like streaming has led to a lot of the old terms in term the old like uh, systems in terms of how writers are compensated for their work to become largely irrelevant. Um, so oh my God. and uh th this was becoming a problem especially with like streaming and uh vod but it but um it, it's an important sticking point for the industry moving forward because obviously streaming is the future so right. um and uh, i don't know what if there's anything that will supplant streaming the way dvds were supplanted but i guess we'll see uh, like direct like directly broadcasting the movie into elon Mu elon musk's like brain chip or whatever but it, but we'll see <laughs> at least for now streaming is the future uh yeah and it's like they're those, taking advantage say, of a new thing it, yeah yeah the, those it, yeah taking advantage of a new thing and they're not being like set legal terms for everything um right. another important thing is um uh is as I said before, lengths of rooms, like uh, they, they're trying to establish like, uh, let's see, um, uh, minimum minimum of at least 10 consecutive weeks of work, which is like a very low floor, but it, it's not as low as like some of these mini rooms have been like trying to squeeze out a season of tele television in a month or and or like having them work for like two to three weeks on an idea for a show deciding whether or not to pick it up based on those three weeks of work and then hiring a full room to work off of those ideas. It's, it's very exploitative. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> that is exploitative uh, as fuck. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so they don't want any more that like pre pre green, green lit room shit happening anymore. Another okay. thing they want is like a minimum amount of writers based on episodes. Now the studios mm -hmm. came back and said like, uh, Oh, but what about these like, these writers who tend to write like all the episodes of TV on their own, like David E. Kelly and stuff and people like that, like David E. Kelly created like uh, uh, Boston legal, Ally McBeal. And he's very well known for writing all the, epi all the episodes himself. But a mm -hmm. lot of these guys came out and said like, we're fine with having other writers like in the room with us and having full pay. We'll just treat them as apprentices rather than, rather than, and like keep doing what we're doing more or less. So like, 
so like it, it's not impeding on these people's process like that like the the guild is fine with writers who are very like individually driven to to put, put everything to paper themselves now i obviously i prefer this prefer like what my boss does and brings in writers and like has each of them write an episode or two whatever but everybody has their own process and we and we don't want like to impede on that too much um okay. but but uh, th th like I said, they, like the guild talked to all these like uh, like epis like all the episodes themselves uh, type uh, type auteurs, and they're all fine with it. So um, the the studio tries to spin this as like as like asking the the guild asking uh, studios to bring in writers to rooms to to pay them for doing nothing. But I the I mean the guild simply disagrees. Like it's important. Even even if writers don't write individual episodes, it it's useful to have writers there to pitch ideas off of, and it's also important if, in the case of these like auteur types that they have people in the room to learn and teach them and right. teach them to be better writers whenever they go off and either write in rooms rooms that don't have a single writer system or go off to create their own shit and perfect sense. Uh, <laughs> and it, so so i obviously i think that's reasonable and it's been a major sticking point i think that's the broad based stuff um yeah. i wish i had better expertise on the healthcare stuff but i i i, no, I just don't fine, the healthcare stuff is complicated <laughs> no it is it really is but hey look guys if you want to see more information on this go to w dot wga contract 2023.org um, I place I placed a little bit of demands on the screen too while PT was explaining. Um, so you get an idea of what the website looks like. So definitely go to that link and see how you can support. They also have a list of uh, events that are going on, a list of actions and stuff to bring more awareness. I saw there was a calendar, which is really good. Really pretty, pretty dope uh, website there. Very easy to use and stuff like that. I don't like the hard websites. It didn't make me look confused when I was looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> Now let's uh let's get into the last part because we're almost uh pinched on time. Um, the big thing in the room that everybody's talking about from from my job to to some other uh Uber Tesla worker, whoever, um, AI. What is we we saw what AI is capable of in the music world, um, which I have to do an episode on that uh because being a musician, I I hear a lot of things about how AI is doing in the music world right now. So I, 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 I'm I'm curious. Are you are you are you referring to are you referring to the Drake and the Weekend song that was supposedly example, completely AI generated? Uh, yes, which is crazy because uh, that song uh, is fine. A thing I learned about that is that the degree <laughs> to which AI was responsible for that was vastly overstated. So the okay. song was composed and written like the lyrics and the music and everything by mm -hmm. the person who like credited himself with the music the thing that ai mm -hmm. did was modulate the voices that he sang himself to sound like drake in the weekend now that's impressive i, I, I don't want to uh, understate that ai will change the way we do a lot of things but mm -hmm. with story after story of like uh, what this what this technology is actually capable of I find myself to be less and less impressed with like the grandiose statements of what it's how it's going to change everything. Okay. Uh, and, and that's like a big example of it. Like people very much misunderstood it, how like how much AI was responsible for that song. And again, it, it that is impressive that it could like convincingly recreate Drake and, and the weekend. But it's not like he, he just typed in a song by Drake and the weekend and it spit that out. Like it, it, the technology is not there yet. It might that be That would have been crazy. Yeah. That would have freaked me out. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But I've like listened to like, um, I've listened to like uh, music that was created in that way that, that was just like the Beatles singing, singing about TikTok. And like, you can oh hear, God. you can hear like Beatles-esque sounds and like they're saying words, but it's sheer nonsense. So again, like the technology might get there eventually, but it, it's not there yet. And, I, okay. and I'm uh, I'm prepared to talk about that in terms of the screenwriting. Yeah, let's do that. Let's get into it. First of all, how how, how does the Writers Guild get affected by by AI? And, and let's start with that point. Like, how does AI affects the, the Writers Guild? 
Well, um, I'll say up top that the guy who I mentioned, Craig Mason earlier, who's a co-host of um, the Script Notes podcast, the other co-host, John August, who's on the negotiating committee for this strike, um, was an er was an early preacher of worries about AI and what mm -hmm. it could potentially do. Um, he's a mm -hmm. tech he's a tech guy, so he has a lot of understanding of this sort of thing. Um, he, uh, John August, to, to just give him credit, he's also, he's known for writing like the Big Fish, uh, or or Big Fish rather, um, uh, Frank and Wee, um, a number oh, of wow. Tim Burton films. Um, so yeah, very successful guy. Um, he, uh, so if anybody wants like it wants to hear like an expert in both like technology and screenwriting talk about this sort of thing go look for anything he's written on the subject or any like podcast episodes on the subject. Um, okay. He could speak to it with much more authority than I can. But um, the, so, okay. So the thing that the studios know and that we know is that it, it might be possible. Maybe I am not granting this, that, that at some point a AI would be capable of like spitting out a fully usable script, maybe not like a brilliant one, but like a <laughs> usable script. The technology is not there yet. It simply is not like it, like like Chat G GPT forgets what it wrote three paragraphs ago. At, like, <laughs> but it, yeah, it forgets what it wrote three paragraphs ago. So um, it's not capable of writing a full screenplay yet. I, I, I will say that I that in terms of where I think the technology is going, that within like five years, it will be very common for screenwriters to use AI for either like prompting ideas or. Mm -hmm. um, or like or just like uh fixing up like basic um like like scene headings and whatnot uh i've been told by people who have already adopted it that like it's like be it's like having a pitch partner that's like a moderately intelligent 10th grader which i know sounds useful useless but um it, it's useful when you consider it it's a free writing partner who doesn't take who doesn't take half the credit um okay but but the goal of the uh, with what the Writers Guild has in terms of the artificial intelligence right now is basically just to get out ahead of it. Um, the proposal is just regulate the artificial use uh, of intelligence on NBA covered projects. AI can't write or rewrite literary material, can't be used as source material, and NBA covered material can't be used to train AI. So I think the last one is the really important sticking point. They don't want anything that's covered under the WGA to be used to train a train your plagiarism machine. I think that's a pretty fair ask. Uh, oh, like yeah, you very fair. You, you, you can't use the stuff that has made you all these vast sums of money. Uh, you can't like plug that into your into your plagiarism machine. Um, <laughs> and I and uh, the other stuff. Um, so like a so like a concern is this is just conceptual because again like AI AI hasn't been able to like produce any like producible material yet but okay. w what people are afraid of is that they'll have AIs do like a first pass on an idea for a movie and it'll be mediocre and then they'll hire a writer to fix it up because the writer will make less money that way um or oh, or the God. idea of ai producing source material because it's not totally unfair to say like okay you're adapting a book the, the a lot of the work is done the story is broken you get this amount less um it, in some cases that's fair in some cases books are really hard to adapt so but, but it depends on the situation but there, there's right. nuance there but when you're talking about like a, a work produced by an ai like it like that's not art that's it wasn't made by a person you're just trying to find ways to make this cheaper and you're just plugging in like uh like like die hard but on a cruise ship into a computer because that's a movie that you think will sell right now and instead mm -hmm. of asking a writer to do that you to do the first pass on that you have ai do it and then just tell the writer to fix it up and a, 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 what I think is a very valid concern is the AI might produce something so useless that you're not even like adapting it so much as just like rewriting it from page one, but yeah. it being treated as a second pass, which means less money. So that so that's a very valid concern as well. Um, and uh, oh, I can and, see the producers wanting to do that so bad. I can see. Oh it. yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, and um, it uh, so the. This is a whole other conversation, but the DGA, um, 
agreed to a deal without a strike. Now that's a whole other can of worms, but they did get concessions yeah. in so far as um, AI cannot get like director's credit. Now I don't think that was a short term concern, but it but at least if it does become a concern in the long term, they have that taken care of. Yeah. But um, uh, there's no technology think, though, right? That AI can actually direct at this point. Like no, never no. I, I mean, I mean, I've seen like um, I've seen like. I mean, it's hideous, but like I've seen like videos that are like made out of like compilations of like various movies and it gets like a general aesthetic vibe that's uh -huh. and it's like interesting to look at. But like no one would pay to see this shit like it's not there <laughs> yet. But like but the DGA was very smart in making sure to get out ahead of that crap in, in case it ever does become a problem. Right. Um, so that that is a um, uh, uh I mean, people are a bit pissed at the DGA for, like, not at the very least waiting until their contract expired to, like, get the best terms that they could, if not straight out go on strike. But we're, yeah. we're doing fine. Like, Screen Actors Guild looks likely to strike. The Teamsters have been very, have, been, have stood in solidarity. Uh, awesome. uh, shout out to them. Um, and uh, IOTC and TAG have all been very supportive. And, I mean, a lot of awesome. individual members of the DGA have been very supportive. But, like, the DGA... Um, I'll, I'll do respect. They're not a particularly democratic union. Like, okay. like WGA votes on everything, whereas the central leadership of DGA has a lot of centralized control. But anyway, mm -hmm. yeah. So back to the AI stuff. It, it um, we there isn't any like sh I I don't have any like short term concerns about about like AI taking the jobs of writers. Like the technology just isn't there yet. One thing that does concern me in like the medium to long term. And I think that everybody should be concerned about this is the idea of it getting to a place where the work it produces is not good, but it's usable and studios deciding that they would rather have it be mediocre and cheap than good and expensive. Oh, uh, yeah. And that would I just lead that. to <laughs> lead to a lot of lead to a lot of like this would be bad for everybody. Like pe like right. some people think will will say like, oh, TV sucks right now. And they, I don't think they're watching a lot of TV because there's plenty of good stuff on TV right now. But, it, <laughs> but if you think it's bad now, it can get so much worse. If like this used to be a joke, like this, like this script feels like it's written by a computer. Whether you say that about like a Transformers <laughs> movie or like right. one of the lower end Marvel movies, like this used to be a joke where you said it feels like a machine wrote this. Well, we could get there. We could like I like if you think a a formulaic Marvel movie feels like trite and annoying wait until you have an actual computer that's just taking from other source material and spitting out like like the literal definition of generic oh, it, that no. would be bad for everybody we like right. we we could end up like looking back on a time where tv and film felt vibrant and creative and and it and and like the vibrant creativity being relative relegated to the indie scene whereas like the big studios are are only producing like computerized crap and not stuff from like visionaries like uh like uh sean ryan or or uh your uh your vince gilligan's or your shonda ryan's who I, I guess is probably kind of controversial but in some in some spaces but uh and i know that yeah. some of your audience would probably roll your eyes at like the mention of aaron sorkin but the, a number of <laughs> a number of in, a number of people who bring their individual voices to the screen and speak to speak to very specific people. And yes, Aaron Sorkin mostly speaks to wine mom suburbanites, but they, but they, have, <laughs> but they have their voice. Um, I, I don't know if you know, Aaron Sorkin created like the West Wing and the newsroom yeah. and um, among like leftist TV consumers, he's, he's, uh, we'll say controversial, but anyway, yeah. it, it, you, you, you want these, it, you want to hear the humanity in television and, Right. My biggest concern is just the notion of the studios just deciding to take cheap crap and everything will feel like it was written. Well, per, well, uh, the easiest comparison, I guess, is like uh, a lot of like soap operas that people like leave on in the background that they yeah. just like re recycle <laughs> the same tropes over and over again that don't even make sense. Like what you died three seasons ago. Like, well, what are you doing here sleeping with your with your sister's <laughs> husband or whatever? Like, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and that's that's my biggest fear i i don't know mm. if i expect it to happen but i'm glad that the guilds the various guilds are trying to get out ahead of it and prevent it from happening 
because I honestly think TV is only as good as it is now because of writers standing up for themselves and saying like, no, we're going to preserve this as a profession. We're going to make sure that smart people can come into this industry, write great television and make a decent living for themselves. And in some cases become very wealthy. Um, mm -hmm. But I honestly think that it, that the people who, that the people who created like great TV shows that are culture that are culturally defining deserve their millions. However you feel about the notion of people getting rich at all more mm -hmm. than the CEOs do like, yeah. uh, like say what you want about Aaron Sorkin. It, when he left the West wing, people noticed, but like yeah. when, when studios go from one CEO to another, no one cares. Like it's yeah. like, nobody. Cares, so though. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, that, that's so true because they just, you know, it's kind of like how no one noticed that uh, Def Jam he goes through CEOs like 24 7. Like, and they just get like millions of dollars <laughs> and they leave. And they're set for life. And then somebody else comes in, get millions of dollars, and they leave. They're set for life. It's like a revolving door. It, it's just, they're not really doing anything. They're just getting money and exploiting the, the, the great artists that put out these bangers for you guys to enjoy and then they, they split <laughs> so right this is this is a good compare and contrast to someone that says that oh well he's a producer so that means he probably works harder than the the, the average worker in hollywood i'm like no 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 he's, he's a producer because they gave him that ability to be a producer because he I, I exploited will, I will say <laughs> I, I will say that's much more true of executives than producers like producers okay. uh, I, I mean I mean there's obviously overlap there but like uh right um pro I mean this is also like nuance of titles like executive producers on movies it, it doesn't really necessarily mean that they did anything uh whereas executive <laughs> producer on TV is like they were very involved in the creative process um okay, so i will gotcha. stick up a little i will stick up a little bit for the producers like it, like these aren't like the like the uh the overrated um executives who don't really who uh kind who take credit for their workers like like these are actually like very involved managerial positions in a lot of right. cases and it's well, shout cases, out to so them. Much, but yeah, yeah I, I, them. I will <laughs> and, and also most like uh the the writers who make a lot of money tend to make a lot of money so not so much as writers but because they're also producers like sean mm -hmm. like makes a very small fraction of his money for the scripts he writes compared to the fact that he's an executive producer on the shows he created and the okay. shows that he produced so i i will i will stick up a little bit um it now uh, there's some nuance here and i'm obviously more defensive of writers and, and writer yeah. producers than of producers in general but it, yeah i'll just say that yeah. Yo, you, PT, thank you so much for coming on. We're getting down to the wire here. Um, this was absolutely really, really good. Um, again, if, if I could say just one more thing. Yeah. Um, if people want to help out in any way, um, I, I've yes. said various things in the past, but the one thing that I think helps more than anything and it, whatever small donation you feel like doing would be helpful is the Entertainment Community Fund, which used to be known as the Actors Fund. It basically okay. just g gives financial help to people affected by like industry slowdowns or shutdowns. So it so it's mostly not going to go to writers, but it is going to go to like other crew, like uh, working people, uh, production assistants, and uh, awesome. and set builders and stuff like that. Um, and they, and they actually have received a lot of money. Have been putting out a lot of money. Obviously, it could never be enough, but we're doing our best and. Obviously, there, obviously, there's collateral damage when there's fights like this, but the, the fights are important to keep up. So right. um, any if anybody is like, I don't know how I can help. I'm not in Hollywood. J just start with that. Yeah. Is there a link to that or is it a part of the uh, uh, WGA? Uh, 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 it, it's not affiliated directly with the WGA. It's the Entertainment Community Fund. OK. Um, yeah. That just just search that. Uh, yeah, just search that in like Twitter, and uh, they have their own link. Um, okay. Uh, so they help like struggling actors, struggling crew, whatever. They 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 operate all the time, just in any industry like times, just whoever needs the help. But obviously, they they've been getting an influx of money recently because they need it right now. So yeah. Right. Awesome. That's really good um, because I I was I had that on my list of questions, and I actually missed that question about how it affects 
um, set work, set designers and um, prop 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 workers, all the aspects of the studio, because I know that that they they might be having a hard time, which is a sacrifice that we have to make. This is not a, a new story at all. A lot of people were strike. When my mom was on strike, you know, she struggled a lot. Um, so well, it's I, a, I Atsi, Ayatsi has been doing a good has been doing a good job, and they represent like basically everybody who's not a writer, producer, or director. Ayatsi represents. Um, they they've been uh, they've been uh, standing in solidarity, and also they they have been doing what they can to help their workers. But um, the community, uh, the entertainment community fund is better funded. So I would just say that 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 they have like the resources and the infrastructure to help out. So just uh, uh but yeah, that it, it it does affect a lot of crew. And um, IOTSI just recently diverted diverted from a strike and got, I mean, they got really good terms for a lot of their workers. Like a lot of people got nice. substantially increased pay, which is impressive since they are not, like the DGA is like the top union in terms of like having sway in this town. But mm -hmm. uh, under that is like the WGA and, and, other, and other guilds. But like IOTSI is not, as, it does not have as big of a dick to swing around, obviously. But mm -hmm. they, they, they did a good job negotiating terms last time and they've been standing in solidarity this time they they i would imagine they might have gone on strike if the if the uh contracts ended around the same time but it, it didn't line up that way um so but yeah it, it it's it's hard on everybody um i'm in a very mm -hmm. fortunate position since uh, my since my boss has been generous enough to cover salaries for support staff support staffers awesome. on his shows um i i can't speak highly enough of him i've already spoken pretty highly of him here but um uh but not everyone's Good in boss. that position and 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 uh it and um but yeah it's it's uh it it's difficult for a lot of people out here so i just wanted to give a shout out to the good work that the that the fund does so yeah thank you so much pt bro i'm not going to take any more of your time i want to thank you so much for coming on here um because this was very informative thank you, Jamar. and i can't wait to let this release this out yeah thank you brother um and i want and what else last question uh what else do you want to do you want to do up there in hollywood is is do you want to be a household writer or do you have other ideas <laughs> as well too because <laughs> you uh, used I, to do yeah. acting so i'm just asking <laughs> uh yeah yeah it, yeah uh, yeah i mean i i I deeply appreciate everything I learned at RCA from uh, from Mr. Singleton and all them, and uh, the and my history in in uh, acting is uh, something that deeply informs like what I'm trying to do now. But yeah. I decided around around the time I was applying for college that I didn't really want to pursue that. That I was much that I was much more comfortable writing my own stuff. And awesome. uh, I mean, actually, my freshman year, I was trying to decide between going into entertainment and going into politics and i did and i just mm. uh and i just committed during my freshman year and um uh and i explored various aspects of it and it ultimately even after working doing a brief stint on reality television my first year out in hollywood uh, it, uh writing was the thing i decided to pursue and um i was lucky enough to get a support staff job out here which is really hard to get like they don't like post these on like job sites or anything you kind of right. uh you kind of have to be lucky or have a decent reputation. Um, but uh, wow, yeah, nice. so um, it, what I'm trying to do in the very short term, and I'm in under a good boss for this, is just um, uh, try to prove myself sufficiently so that I can be given, either be given a script or to be given a staff job on uh, either one of Sean's shows or one or a show of like somebody else. And I, I know other showrunners, so um Hopefully that'll work out for me in the next like couple years, and the yeah the long term goal is to like create my own my own show. But um, honestly, if I was able to just consistently work as a staff writer writing other people's stuff for the rest of my life, I'd be more than happy. But you know, show running's the dream. That's that's what I'm going for. Awesome, PT, bro. I mean, I wish you the best of luck out there, bro. I'm so happy that you're in this, bro. Like everybody, all the alums from 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 that era, like 
I'm yeah. so happy that I've seen a lot of people still doing it, man. So I definitely wish you the best of luck and all the success in, in, in the Writers Guild. When, when, when you get into the Writers Guild <laughs> and every yeah. all your other endeavors, bro, I really do. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jamar. It's been it's been a pleasure, and uh, I uh, and uh, thanks for uh, thanks for hearing everything I had to say and uh, for for plugging the entertainment community fund. That's probably the most important thing I can do coming on to these things. Hell yeah, man. Hell yeah. Right on. Have a good day, my brother. And everybody out there, you have a really good day too. Blank period, yeah. I'm a black, brown, and indigenous. Gotta holler if you really feeling this. Gotta holler if you really real enough. Other rappers is delirious. Yeah, it's really that serious. Better holler if you really feeling me. I gotta keep it a hundred. Ay. If you don't like it, then fuck it. Ay. We gonna win in the end. Yeah, we gonna live in abundance. I gotta keep it a hundred. If you don't like it, then fuck it. Ay. We gonna win in the end. Yeah, we gonna, we gonna, we gonna. I gotta keep it a hundred. We gotta stop all the stunting. You know we coming from nothing. Yo, you talking about money, you bluffing. We gotta do something different. We gotta change how we live in. We gotta do better for women. We gotta do better for children. We gotta listen to victims, whether Jewish and Muslim or Christian. It doesn't matter your religion. You gotta stand against the system, or else you're just another villain. How you just sitting there chilling?